Hi everybody, welcome back to Mysteries and Histories. I'm Michelle Bennington. It has been a while since I've been here. I think the last time I left a video was back in March, uh, but a lot has been going on since then. I have released my very first book from Level Best Books. It's called Devil's Kiss. It's a cozy mystery set in Kentucky, and it involves a amateur sleuth solving mysteries at a bourbon distillery. So it's a lot of fun, and I've been trying to, you know, market that, which is kind of a full-time job in and of itself, and then I do work full-time outside of being a writer, and uh, I have had some health issues, and so there's just been a whole lot going on. <laughs> But I'm back and I'm going to do my very best to drop at least one video a month. Right now, I think that's probably going to be the best that I can manage. Please check out my blog at michellebennington.com. I do put a lot of stuff there. So if you remember, or if you've seen the, vid the last video that I posted back in March, I promised you a review of a book. It's a history book, it's nonfiction. It's called Empire of the Summer Moon. Quanna Parker and the Rise and Fall of the Comanches, the Most Powerful Indian Tribe in American History by S.C. Gwynn. And it, it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. That's what that says there. And as you can see, I have been all through this book. I mean, and it's, it's such a good book. And I've heard that they're going to be making a movie out of this which I hope they do. I'd be interested to see how that fleshes out exactly. And I've got my notes, <laughs> pages of notes. And I'm just gonna read through my notes on this and just give you, it'll be a semi-in-depth review of the book. So it'll be, it'll be a much deeper review than other reviews I've done so far, but it won't be as extensive as I would like it to be. So really the subtitle of this nonfiction book says everything. It's about Quanah Parker and the rise and fall of the Comanche Indian tribe. But it's about so much more than that. It's about the formation of the United States Western frontier. It's about the complicated socio-political relations between settlers, the federal and state governments, the various Indian tribes and Mexico. And we get a glimpse of how complicated the Wild West was. And really, I think the first chapter should have been called an introduction because it gives a brief overview of the more critical events in the Comanche Empire downfall before it starts unwinding and getting into minute detail. So the story really begins, I think, in chapter two with the formation of Texas and a lot of the politics surrounding that major event. In the Texas Territory, there is a convergence of the lives and stories and politics of the settlers of all races, uh, both from other parts of the United States or people who were completely new to the U.S., as well as the Comanche, the Arapaho, the Apache, Cheyenne, Western Sioux Indian tribes, and a host of separate bands of Indians within those tribes, um, the U.S. government and emerging Texas Republic and Mexico. So it is a super complicated socio-political landscape. And it seems at first glance that everyone was fighting each other. Um, and I guess in many ways that's true, but there was also a collaboration among these groups for both survival, physical survival, and for political survival too. We have this convergence of all these different settlers, the US government, the new Texas government, and you know, all these different things, you know, in this little cauldron of the Texas territory at that time. And we had this group called the Comanches. And so all of these groups coming in to Comanche territory was a problem for the Comanches. For a moment, it looked as though the Comanches might actually win and reclaim the territory and chase everyone out. They were that fierce and that honestly vicious. They were an empire. By every measure and standard that we would name any other culture an empire, the Comanches were equal in territory and fighting power. 
and military strategy, and they were every bit as powerful as any European empire that they might have encountered. So all of this is to say that the Comanche were fierce, powerful, smart, savvy, strong, and capable. They were not weak or stupid or powerless by any stretch of the imagination. And over time, yes, they did become worn down. Um, their resources were scarce. Their people were getting killed in, in battles and wars and, and they were dying of diseases. And so there were things that were coming against them and kind of all at once. But the Comanche held their own for hundreds of years and they chased people out of their territory for hundreds of years. They were strong. And the, the reality is that throughout history, nations rise and nations fall. People are conquered and people do the conquering. And that is true all over the world and uh, new nations rising and old nations falling and new nations being formed and old nations you know, passing into history. I mean, it's, it's history, it's what it is. History is brutal because humans are brutal and we always have been. Um, I don't, but the one thing that I don't want to do is I do not want to paint the Comanche as weak and incapable of fighting back. The biggest problem for the Comanche was that it wasn't just the settlers that were coming in. It wasn't just diseases that were killing off their people. It wasn't just a uh, lack of resources. It wasn't just those things that we often hear about. The reality is that the Comanches were behind the times. We had industrialization was going forward at a rapid pace. I mean, we're talking around the 1830s, 1840s. So industrialization was going forward. It was pushing, it was, it was gonna be unstoppable. It was inevitable and there was not gonna be any way to stop it. And the Comanche were in large part still living kind of in the stone age at that time. I mean, they were living very much as their ancestors from thousands of years ago lived. And because at that time, when the settlers first came, there wasn't much cross-contamination, shall we say, of cultures. You know, they weren't really adopting any of the, of the European settlers' ways or their clothing or their uh, implements or tools or anything like that. There was still a, a very distinct separation between that Stone Age era Comanche and the industrialized European coming in or the pre-industrialized European. As the years progressed, so of course did the industrialization era and um, the Comanches just weren't keeping pace with what was happening all over the, the Western world specifically. I mean, this wasn't just happening in, the, in America, it was happening in Canada and in England and, and in Europe. What happened to the Comanche was inevitable, I believe. I mean, when I read this book and I, I think about, um, you know, some of the forces that were coming against the Indian tribes at the time, I think it was inevitable. They would not have been able to maintain the way they were living for very long because of industrialization. Really what we're dealing with isn't just a difference in culture, but it was a difference in era, in times. Uh, it's like a time warp where the fast developing modern world ran up against an ancient world still living very much like the Stone Age. But it didn't happen in a blink. It took hundreds of years for this to unfold. And there were many times when the Comanches were victorious over uh, the European settlers coming into their territory. The Spanish conquistadors and the U.S. cavalry troops, the Texas Rangers, the Mexicans, the settlement camps, they all had just a horrible time trying to protect themselves against the onslaught of Comanche invaders. They were constantly raiding both in U.S. and in Mexico. And it became such a problem that many of the white settlements were emptied out completely. And as time went on, the raids became more numerous and increasingly violent and brutal. In fact, uh, Wise County in Texas had over 3,000 people in 1860 and by 1870, half that population had left because of all the constant raiding and brutality. And the Comanches, they were vicious. <laughs> People came to dread moonlit nights. 
which soon came to be known as the Comanche Moon because entire families and settlements would be wiped out. Uh, as S.C. Gwynn points out, Peter Nakona, who was Quanna Parker's father, was responsible for the destruction of uh, families with, as he says on page 154, families with the names Youngblood and Rippy lost forever to history ceased to exist, leaving only smoking burned out cabins and bodies mutilated beyond recognition and the Indians richer in horses, scalps, and captive women and children. And this is actually how Quanah came into being was because his father, Peter, captured a little girl from Parker's Fort, Parker's Settlement in Texas, uh, a little girl by the name of Cynthia Ann Parker. She was nine or 10 at the time. She was very young, captured her and her sister, and I think maybe a couple of other women um, and some other children and held them captive and turned them into slaves. The older women were beaten and brutalized and raped. Um, the men, during the raid were mutilated. Their genitals were cut off. They were scalped while they were still living. They were um, stabbed repeatedly and shot repeatedly with arrows and stabbed repeatedly with, with spears. Um, they were tortured. They were tortured to death. And then um, the women were taken back to camp and turned into slaves and and raped repeatedly. And the children were raised with the other Indian children and raised up just like Comanche. So they were brought into the culture and raised up in the culture. And so by the time Cynthia Ann, uh, she was eventually rescued, but she was in her, she had already had two or three children by that time and had lived so long with the Comanches. I think she was maybe in her 20s and she had already lived with them so long that she no longer remembered English. She no longer remembered her life in the white settlement. Um, as far as she was concerned, she was Comanche. And so, but that's how Quana even came into being was because his mother was a captive. And this was something that was common among the Comanche. They would raid settlements. They would take all the horses they could because horses for them were um, a symbol of wealth. So where we value the dollar, they valued horses. And um, they always tried to get as many horses as they could wherever they went. And then they would take food or whatever else, you know, that, that they thought they could use. And then everything else was burned down. And uh, as I said earlier, the men were brutalized to death and uh, the women and children captured. Most of them captured, some of them would be killed. They weren't kind, <laughs> they weren't kind. The Comanches meant business. You were not going, you know, there was no playing with the Comanches. The raids became so frequent and so brutal that the Texas government was compelled to do something to, to try to save people's lives because so many people were being killed and destroyed and mutilated and, and you know, property damage and all, all of that. And they formed, they began forming the Texas Rangers, was, which was just this kind of ragtag bunch of young men who didn't really have anything else going for them in life. You know, they didn't have family or, or kids or wives or any of that. And they were largely uneducated and just, you know, kind of these, guys who had nothing else going on. And so they they joined this band of Texas Rangers to go out and, and hunt down the Comanches and um, return the captives if they could, or honestly to destroy the Comanche villages because it was kind of at that point tit for tat. If you're gonna destroy our, our settlements and kill our people and mutilate our people, then we're gonna give you a dose of the same. And that's kind of what was going on. I mean, it was the Wild West, a very different time, very different rules, um, eye for an eye sort of mentality. But the Comanches for the longest time were really hard for, for the Texas Rangers to fight, the white settlers, the um, Mexican inhabitants who had lived there for a long time, any of the European settlers, any of the government officials. It was really hard for these, for any of these people to fight the Comanche because the Comanches were so superior in horsemanship. Uh, they were like 
the ultimate horse whisperer. You know, they they were one with their horse and they could do things on their horses that nobody else could. I mean, the the European settlers, it was all they could do to just stay in the saddle and ride for long periods of time through the desert. Meanwhile, the Comanche could lay down on the back of their, on the side of their horse and shoot arrows from behind their horse using a horse as a shield. Like they did all of these crazy acrobat things on their horses. And so, and then in addition to that, they had superior technology at the time because what the settlers had to defend themselves was was either a Kentucky rifle, which was a one-shot gun, which was complicated and cumbersome to reload. By the time you shot your Kentucky rifle, reloaded, and aimed to shoot again, a Comanche had already shot like maybe 30 arrows at you. <laughs> and it was hard for you to hit the Comanche because they're twirling around on their horses and they can't, you know, so they're a moving target in every sense of the word and they had superior firepower. Uh, that changed a little bit once the uh, Colt revolver was invented. It was originally a five shooter and then later was developed into a six shooter. And that gave the, the Texas Rangers and the settlers, that gave them a, more of an advantage against the Comanche, at least in terms of firepower. But then they still had the issue of they couldn't ride horses <laughs> as well as the Comanche could. And then another advantage that the Comanche had was that they would come in at night and they would come in very quietly. You couldn't hear them. And so while the settlers were asleep or while the rangers were asleep, they they would sneak in, cut all the horses free, take the horses out, and they would just completely raid the settlement or the village or the encampment before any of the sleeping people knew what was going on. And then they would be dozens of miles, dozens and dozens of miles away before anybody even realized what was going on. <laughs> So, and and because they were superior on their horses and they knew the territory so well, they could ride so fast through the desert and through the, the mountains and the territory, they moved so quickly that no one could ever catch up with them. They had superior knowledge of the territory, superior command of the horses, and superior firepower. And that's why they were undefeatable for such a long time. So that was really the first part of the book is kind of this setup of the history of what the frontier was like, who was living there, what the socio-political, cultural environment was like, what it was like to live in those days and what it was like to live among the Comanche. And I should say that it wasn't just the settlers and the government having a problem with the Comanche either. There were other Indian tribes having a huge problem with the Comanche. And so whatever they gave to the settlers and the government, they gave in equal measure to other Indian tribes. So there was a constant, so the Comanche were warlords. They loved to fight and they loved to raid. And it was just something that they did. It was their life. It was how they lived. He spends the first part of the book really establishing this sense of place and what it must have been like. And that was probably one of my favorite parts of the whole book is that you really get a feel for what it must have been like, how difficult life was back then for everybody, not just for the Indians, not just for Mexicans, not just for, but for everybody. No one had it easy. And I couldn't imagine living, like for instance, in Parker's Fort, where they were right on the border between Texas and Mexico. They were that very edge of the Western frontier. How, and there was no one else around for miles and miles. How lonesome that would have been and how dangerous that would have been. Because it wasn't just Comanche who would raid and war against the settlers. It's just that the Comanche were the most feared but there were also the Cheyenne and Arapaho and Apache. I mean, there were all these other 
Indian tribes and bands within those tribes who would, you know, have raids against settlers and against the inhabitants who had lived there for a long time, like the Mexicans. And I mean, they raided everybody <laughs> and they raided each other. It just seemed like life back then was just kind of a constant battle, a constant struggle in a way that we modern people just really can't relate to. And I can't imagine having to deal with all of that while it's summertime and it's hot and there's no AC. <laughs> like life, <laughs> I just can't even imagine how hard life was for everyone back then and how much softer we have it now in comparison. And I'm not saying we don't struggle and I'm not saying there aren't people who struggle in this world. There are, of course. The average American, and I'm speaking just in terms of America right now, the United States, the average person in the United States has it infinitely better. I mean, we live in such luxury compared to what life would have been like back then. It was it was just really fascinating. You you really got a sense of that from the book. And then he goes into more of Quana Parker. So then the rest of the book was more about him and his biography and, and how he came up and he learned to become influential, not just among the Comanche, but among the US government and the Texas government and white settlers. And he became really a powerful diplomat for his tribe. It was under him that the tribe, the tribe did finally go to a reservation once, once the final battles had been won by the U.S. government uh, and, and the Texas Republic and, and the Comanche were at last rounded up and, and put on the reservation. He was like an ambassador for his people on the reservation and he he had a great deal of respect among the white officers who who managed the reservation and among uh, the governors of of the state and he even had a great deal of respect from uh teddy roosevelt too i mean he met with teddy roosevelt and uh tried to help influence you know good policies for his people that would help his people and he was the largest Indian land owner of his day. He owned more head of cattle and more horses than any other, I think than any other Indian in his day, if I'm not mistaken. Before before they went to the reservation, I mean, he was, he was a, a top-notch military strategist too. And for the longest time, his, his tribe was able to, to defeat and outsmart all of the people coming after him, the cavalrymen, the US government, the Texas government, the Texas Rangers, all of these people coming after the Comanche. So he was um, really a fascinating, fascinating guy. Uh, and there were some other interesting characters that were mentioned in the book that were very much a part of frontier life, like Kit Carson and uh, Ranald McKenzie and Rachel Plummer. And I want to read more about all of them and, and give a report, so to speak, on them too and talk about them and their lives because they seem like really fascinating people. So the last several chapters really focus on life on the reservation and Quana's rise to power and wealth. Uh, I wrote a biography of Quana Parker where I, I delve more into just him uh, on my blog on michellebennington.com. So I don't want to rehash all of that here, but I do want to say that he was one of the most powerful Indian chiefs to ever exist. And he met with President Teddy Roosevelt a few times and they went hunting together. And uh, he, he negotiated terms for his people. Quana lost, of course, <laughs> but uh, because I doubt that Roosevelt really had much genuine interest in helping the Indians. I, I'm going to be honest here and say that I don't know a whole lot about Roosevelt's his political history, especially in dealing with the Indians, but I'm, I'm just going to guess. I'm just going to take a stab at it and say that he probably wasn't as concerned about helping the Indians as he was about helping 
himself and his cronies and the elites and kind of like it has always been in all government throughout time. <laughs> I mean, let's be, I mean, let's keep it real. Um, it just seems that, and maybe, maybe I'm being cynical and a little jaded, but it just seems that government, government has always been more concerned with helping themselves and each other and the elite classes more so than just the common people. And that seems to kind of be a thread that has carried through in my, in everything that I've read of history, kings, queens, sultans, whoever they may be. I'm just saying the common people are kind of like an afterthought. You know, it's kind of like, well, you know, we'll throw them a few crumbs. Let them eat cake. That's my personal input right there. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to be as objective as possible though. I really am. But the last few chapters in the book really shine a light on Kwana's brilliant political and business savvy and his leadership, not just as a diplomat, but in everyday situations among people on the reservation and in his own personal business affairs. Uh, he managed very quickly to become the richest Indian leader of his day. And again, there's so much in this book about particular important people during this time, important events like the Civil War, certain raids or skirmishes or battles, um, that I, I just really can't talk about all of them here, but they, they are important to having a complete understanding of, of the time, of what he was going through, of just the situation for everybody. It really helps to get a much deeper understanding of this little slice of American history. I said it before, I'll say it again, this book really opened my eyes to what life must have been like on the frontier how hard and brutal it was for everyone. And it gave me a more balanced view of the history of that era, which is why I really encourage everyone to get the book and read it. Uh, check it out at the library if you can't afford to purchase it. I'm, I, again, I'm, I'm gonna try to be very objective here. We get into our way of seeing things politically. And we as modern people, especially it seems in this era, we have great difficulty in separating our modern sensibilities from past cultures and eras and peoples. And uh, I think it is so important to really uh, try to stay as balanced and as open-minded as possible when reading historical texts and to really fight against reading things through a modern lens. I think it is so crucial to resist that urge of reading history through a modern lens because they, they came from completely different situations in a completely different time, a completely, everything was different. Everything was different. And when you're, when everything you do each and every day is just trying to survive and help your family survive, when everything literally comes down to survival, I think that's going to going to mold you and shape you and make you see things differently than maybe we do. And it's going to shape a worldview in you that we would not maybe consider having. So we get into these political and ideological ruts. We all are guilty of it at some point or another. But I, I really liked this book because I felt like the author, S.C. Gwynn, I felt like he really did work to, to maintain that sense of fairness and, and balance. My personal view is that I came away from this book a little conflicted. And I think that's the sign of a truly well-written, mostly apolitical historical book because we humans are tribal by nature. We want to pick sides. We so easily slip into this us versus them mentality and we have to only read or watch our news cycles in our modern era to see that in action. But with this book, it's so difficult because I can find sympathy for both sides. 
There are times when I really feel sympathy for the Indians, and there are times when I really feel sympathy for the white settlers. They both had their struggles and their conflicts and their heartaches. And settler life and Indian life too was so gritty and grueling and hard and so much harder than any modern people can possibly comprehend. And industrialization was bearing down on everyone in all Western countries at breakneck speed, but because the Indians had been further removed from it, they were utterly unprepared and overwhelmed by the greed and lust for the accumulation of land and wealth that had been drummed up in many settlers' hearts and in the hearts of the government too. And so for that reason, I, I have sympathy for the Indians too, because they were simply unprepared for what was coming. And there was no way they could have prepared for it because as I said earlier, it was like they were living in a completely different era. They were still living back in the Stone Age. You know, they were still hunting with spears and arrows. You know, when, when I think about that era and when I think about the book, industrial industrialized life was bound to displace the lives of the Indians and advance the lives of the settlers. I really can't see it happening any other way. They would have eventually either fought against it to their utter annihilation, or they would have assimilated to the annihilation of their culture. And I I wonder if maybe Kwana understood that because he did receive some criticism for selling out, for taking his people to the reservation. He, maybe he opted to save his people to the best of his ability by choosing the reservation, thinking that might be a, a better way to go, especially since food was becoming increasingly scarce, since the settlers and the buffalo traders were going in and just destroying the buffalo population. Buffalo was the only thing the Comanches really ate. Sometimes in a pinch, they would eat small rodents or, you know, any other little things that they could catch and kill, but especially in, you know, in lean times when they were, you know, really hungry, they were finding it harder and harder to get resources and food. So maybe they thought, well, if we go to the reservation, at least we can feed our people. So maybe they thought that maybe Kwana thought that that would be the best thing. It's that or starvation. Maybe he hoped also that it would be a place where the people and the culture could continue sheltered from complete assimilation and complete destruction. Maybe what he couldn't have foreseen was how the federal government was often ill-prepared, incompetent, untrustworthy, and given over to cronyism, often at the expense of the poor and the downtrodden of all people. And again, I'm going to insert some of my own political cynicism here, but that's kind of what we see in governments throughout history and today even, where the government is just often ill-equipped, ill-prepared, or just flat incompetent to manage and administrate things so that everyone thrives. So in all... You know, I got to the end of the book and I was just, I was kind of overwhelmed. It was, it was a difficult history to swallow. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I'm still carrying that tension of feeling sympathy for the Indians and how hard they fought and feeling sympathy for the settlers, knowing how hard they fought and that most of them were poor immigrants uh, or transplants from other states or nations just trying to make a life and that they also were often victim, victims of government policy and behavior just as the Indians were. Uh, in some ways, it, it was almost like they were in the same boat. Both of them were fighting for survival. Both of them had hard lives. You know, the, the government gave away land to settlers like the Parkers so that they could lure them into extremely dangerous territories and situations in order to settle the frontier and to capture more land for the U.S. The settlers took an enormous risk, many of them completely unaware of exactly how dangerous it was until it was too late. And that's what happened to the Parkers. They didn't, you know, the government said, here, we'll give you this chunk of land if you'll go and work the land and, and live there and settle it and, 
and make a place and help us extend the territory and they were all for it, but they did not understand nor were they informed of how dangerous it would be. And they found out. And the Comanche gave settlers, governments, and other tribes hell every step of the way until the tables turned on them. So I keep going in circles on this book. And though I do have a deep sympathy for what happened to the Indians, I can't come down on just one side. And that, my friends, is what makes this a fabulous history book. So if I were to rate this, five stars being the best, one star being the worst, it gets a five. It is so well written. The pacing is good. It's very dense. There's a lot of information. I know that I'm going to have to read this book again at some point because there's just so much there. And I don't know how he squeezes it in. It's only like 319 pages long. But there's so much information crammed into those 300 pages. Yet at the same time, it wasn't so dense that you felt like you were dragging and reading and reading it like a history textbook. No, it was kind of like reading a novel. That's how it was just so good. But then I'm a history geek too. So, well, that's all I have right now. Uh, next time I post a video, I hope to talk about another book by Holly Tucker called City of Lights, City of Poison. Very good book too. Please, you know the drill, hit the subscribe, the notification bell, all that stuff, and feel free to follow me on my other social media platforms. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and I also have my own webpage where I do a blog once a month dealing with mysteries and histories at michellebennington.com. And if you are interested in reading a fun, cozy mystery set in Kentucky in a bourbon distillery, check out my new book, Devil's Kiss. It's the first in a series of three. It came out May 31st and the next book will come out in May of 2023. You can check it out on amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com. Thanks for stopping by. See you later. Take care.